Okay, let's get on with this. Um, there's a lot in here that I've read through, a lot of the same questions, so we're going to try to, the one that keeps coming up is we don't want you to leave us. And um, call Tallahassee. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they, they, they want to talk about the health care. And uh, is, it, is it, you know, what's happening with that? What, what are you seeing there? Uh, and just kind of talk a little bit. I know you addressed it. Well, there, there are two things. Uh, Supreme Court can come back. I don't think that they can rule the entire health care law unconstitutional. But the thing was, in the rush to get it out there, there was no severability clause that was put into it. So that if the Supreme Court comes back and says that the individual mandate is not in keeping and not constitutional as you uh, evaluate it against the Commerce Clause, then because there is no severability, it could cause the entire health care law to be then for, you know, therefore ruled unconstitutional. Now, this is what we have to look at. We want to protect our seniors with the, uh, the donut hole with, with uh, Medicare, no doubt. If you want to keep your child on your health insurance up to 26, that's your choice, no problem. If, you know, we want to make sure that we cover people for pre-existing conditions, that's fine. Now, those three things that I just said, now, that I agree with, I can fit that within probably about 10 to 15 pages of legislation. It's the other 2,685 or 90 pages that brings forth that chart that you showed, that I showed you. 159 new government agencies and bureaucracies, 16,000 new IRS agents, 11 new taxes, you're gonna see capital gains taxes go up. How many seniors here use dividends? Okay, dividends taxes. We're looking at dividends taxes going from 15% up to 44.1%. Okay, death taxes, estate tax, real estate transaction tax, 3.8% real estate transaction tax. Those are the type of things we don't want. $575 billion in cuts to Medicare. That's not how we want to protect and preserve that program. And as we talked about the Independent Payment Advisory Board, 15 member panel, unelected bureaucrats, they make decisions about Medicare price controls. And the only way that Congress can reverse a decision that the IPAB makes is a three-fifth supermajority coming out of the Senate. So that's what we have to start looking at fixing. Now, if the Supreme Court comes back and says that the individual mandate is okay in their interpretation of the law and the Commerce Clause, then come January of 2013, you got a choice. Either you want it to stay on the books, which means that you will see an incredible detriment over time to the healthcare industry in the United States of America, or you get that thing removed, repealed, and replaced. That's the choices. Now, the Supreme Court pretty much so made their decision already Friday. They uh, probably handed out the assignments for majority opinion writing and dissenting opinion writing, and we'll get to know the final verdict sometime in May, June. And that's where it is. What effects are currently underway for increasing friendly business relationships with Canada and all our rich nation? Well, if I could have been a fly on the wall uh, yesterday when Stephen Harper, the president, and uh, President Calderon were talking, uh, it would have been interesting to hear the decision about the Keystone XL uh, pipeline. We already know the Prime Minister Harper, they have the resources. If it does not come south, they're talking about it going west. And China's already interested in that. You know, last Friday, when we heard the talk about, you know, the oil and natural gas industry and how bad they are, it was the exact same day that a Chinese oil and gas company went past ExxonMobil. And this company that China, that this Chinese company, is 86% controlled by the Chinese government. And they did it in 13 years. So, Everywhere that you're finding natural resources, energy resources, raw materials, anywhere across the world, you will find a Chinese plant. Now, wouldn't it be a shame if one day in the future our children are having to go to 
China for energy resources. And don't forget, how many people know what Scarabay 09 is? Okay. This is the type of thing that you all need to know. Scarabay 09 is a Chinese made oil rig that is 55 to 60 miles off the coast of Key West. That it was uh, in January, was rented out to a Spanish company called Repsol, and it is drilling in waters that are deeper than deep water horizon. And Ken Salazar, the Secretary of Interior, and our administration provided some technical advice and expertise to them to input in place that oil rig. Scarabay 09 meets no standards of an American oil rig or platform. And if there's a catastrophic event, call up your Coast Guard right here and they'll tell you, they'll show you the path that that oil slip will take. It's right here. Along that line, uh, Mr. Zappi was, uh, writes, he wants to know as the president given the uh, the infrastructure road job to China. Is there any way, is, is he giving it to China or are we bringing, is there a way to get it back in the United States? You mean infrastructure construction? Uh, Mr. Zapp, yes, sir. Yes, uh, uh, I understand that the uh, Chinese government has approved Well, I think what you know, there is a bridge, I think they're talking about in California that's going to be constructed using a lot of Chinese uh, materials. And, uh, you know, we need to have a construction here. You know, if you go back and look at some of the regulations coming out of EPA against the cement industry, I mean, it is really, you know, horrific and, and the disadvantage they're trying to place them on. We don't want to see our construction uh, industry having to go to China and elsewhere for the cement uh, resources that we can make right here. You know, that's CMEX that is, uh, has a headquarters right up there in West Palm Beach. Now, let me dovetail off into something else. The uh, transportation infrastructure highway bill, okay, we did pass a 90-day extension in the House of Representatives because the Senate came out with an 18-month, uh, two-year extension. When you talk to people in the construction industry, that's not good enough for them to go out there and start investing capital and equipment and things of that nature. We want to get this right. We want to have a full five-year extension of that highway transportation bill. So we have funded for the next nine, uh, 90 days, and we will do the right thing and get that extended for a full five years. But we've got to make sure we're protecting the American industry. Mary Dorsey wants to talk about the military health care and cost of living allowances and retirement benefits. Should Congress be allowed to keep their beneficiary Benefic benefits and raises and the military cannot. Well, as you know, Congress has not had any uh, pay increases because the, the pay has been frozen. I'm glad to know that that has happened upon my arrival. Uh, as well, we do pay into a Blue Cross Blue Shield type of program. Now, the problem is this. A lot of people have not paid attention to it, but in the President's budget, there's a proposal to triple the health care rates for TRICARE over the next three to five years. That's reprehensible. As a matter of fact, I sit on the Military Personnel Subcommittee, and we had the representatives from all the services of health care, and then also the Department of Defense Undersecretary for Health Care Matters. We're talking about penalizing 9 million Americans that have served in uniform and their health care benefits. That's less than 1% of this nation. And you can't tell me that the one, that less than one percent of this nation has to be a bill payer. It's just, it's, it, it doesn't add up. And so, basically, what you're looking at for myself, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel, 22 years. I currently pay about $460 a year on the Tricare standard. It will raise those rates to about $2,200 a year under the Tricare standard. Now, okay, can I take care of that? Sure. But think about the E7 or the E8 that's retired. And when you talk about tripling his health care rates, that's going to have a significant economic impact on him. But even getting beyond the numbers, it's a moral decision. Because once upon a time, this nation said, if you serve 20 plus years in the United States military, you and your spouse will receive free quality health care for the rest of your lives. 
We broke that promise, we created Champions. Champions didn't work so well, we tr created TRICARE. And we said, okay. But now they're talking about tripling. And we actually took money from TRICARE last year and we gave it over to the Operations and Maintenance Budget in the Department of Defense. So we're not bankrupt healthcare as far as the military is concerned. This is a moral decision. George Washington once said, the future generations of Americans will determine whether or not they will serve this nation based upon how well we treat our veterans. Let me tell you, a lot of young men and women in uniform are starting to ask themselves when they see some of the things that are happening. We got a great military. It's a voluntary military. But we got to take care of it. One of our business leaders here in Pompano Beach asks a question. If Republicans on a federal and state level are so concerned about ensuring jobs for American citizens and returning veterans, why are they stonewalling E-Verify and enforcement measures? Which enforcement measures? E-Verify? E -verify. Well, look, I don't want to stonewall E-Verify. Uh, and I know that there were some issues here in the state of Florida about E-Verify. You know, we got to do something about the legal immigration situation in the United States of America. Illegal immigration is a multi-heavy hydro. It's a national security issue. It's an economic issue. It's a health care issue. It's an education issue. It's a local criminality issue. You know, back in the Reagan administration, the decision was made to have an amnesty program, but the federal government was supposed to enforce their laws and secure our borders, and we still have not done that. Now, what I want to make sure that we do, we can institute and verify, but let's be very smart about how we do it. Because what you see happen in Georgia and Alabama, because I went up and I talked to some of the folks up in Martin County, St. Lucie County, and the Citrus and Cali side of the house, we can't totally destroy the agricultural industry in the United States of America. And they understand it. They understand that something has to be done. But they don't want to be put to such a disadvantage. But the next thing you know, we depend on, become dependent upon other countries for our food sources. Take a drive out west to the western part of Palm Beach County. Now, I gotta tell you, you know, a lot of people say that you know, folks are out there doing jobs that Americans won't do. If we restructure our corporate business tax rate, if we make sure we do the right thing so that Americans can get a good and proper wage, Americans will get out there and work. And I would rather see Americans working than Americans sitting around and getting more food stamps and being more dependent upon poverty. But, you know, once upon a time, my wife's Jamaican, and we sat down and had this discussion. You know, the United States of America used to offer these temporary visas where you could come and be a seasonal worker up here in the United States of America. And you would work in a seasonal period, and then at the end of that seasonal period, you would go back. We can have that type of program. We need to improve our visa programs in some of these other countries. But what I tell you is that we cannot do is continue down a path where we ignore illegal immigration. And we cannot continue down the path where we try to protect everybody's little single rice bowl. Because people are finding the gaps, and the next thing you know, the millions upon millions of dollars that the American taxpayers are losing because of illegal immigration, it's going to affect our economy. It's going to bring us down sooner or later. But we have to be pragmatic about how we do this. We have to be smart about how we do this. Because the last thing we want to see is all of a sudden produce prices in the grocery store go sky high. And you're already seeing commodity prices increase. Why? Because of gas prices. Okay. Now let me tell you another little thing about gas prices. When you have monetary policy that is absolutely horrible, that's devaluing your dollar against the increase of the oil per barrel cost, that's how you end up with these high prices as well. You cannot continue to print more money. You cannot continue to monetize your debt. You cannot continue to keep interest rates artificially low at zero percent. Now that's what I look at. We're not out of the woods yet. If we were out of the woods, interest rates would not still be at zero percent. I'm going to make notes on this next question. Mr. Seaman, I believe, asks, is there a way to find out about all the new regulations that are being written by the federal government? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, you can go and uh, Google search the Federal Register, and you will find that in calendar year 2011, the federal government added over 71,000 new pages of regulations to the Federal Register in one year. Okay, And uh, as I always tell people, the administrator of the EPA, Lisa Jackson, 
testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee. She was asked one simple question. Do you take into account the economic impact of the regulations that you're producing? She said no. Google up numeric nutrient criteria. And that will give you a, an understanding of how insidious some of these regulations are. Basically, they were telling some municipalities and they were telling farmers that if they could not produce runoff water that was parts per billion purer than rainwater, they would be fine. Now, when they asked the EPA regulators what's the formula to come up with water that is parts per billion purer than rainwater, they didn't have a formula. They just said, if you don't have it below this level, you're going to get fined. That's how we're killing businesses and even local municipalities with the regulation. Now, I know the Sun Sentinel just put out a, a little piece about this uh, pool lift thing. Okay? What? Federal government. See? See? You got the car now. You do? <laughs> the federal government just came out with a, a new regulation saying that all pools have to have a permanent handicap pool lift. Permanent. Okay, all pools, or else, you know, you know, hotel, restaurants, things like that, or else you'll be fine. Now, think about this. Why couldn't it just be temporary? Why couldn't you just say, please provide a handicapped pool lift at your facility, at your hotel? Let it be temporary, so that if someone is there, they have access. If they're not there, it's put up. And what's the other thing, the, the unintended consequence? What happens if that permanent pool lift is out there and it's spring break and a bunch of kids get out there unsupervised and they start using the pool lift as a little mini diving board and then they get hurt? Do you think that they're going to take responsibility and say, oh, I'm sorry, it's my fault? No. Or let's say some children are there and they get too close to the pool the permanent pool lift and they hurt themselves on it. Are the parents that maybe were not paying attention to the child want to say, you know, it was my fault, I didn't pay attention to the child? No. You are opening these people up to more litigation that comes from the trial lawyers who are always out there looking. So, you know, again, this is the federal government sitting down and not doing something that is reasonable, common sense. They're dictating on hot which causes more expenditure of resources and funds for our small businesses. And most of the, you know, hotels and, and restaurants that you see along A1A, those are mom and type of hotels. Not big, you know, Ritz Carlton's or whatever. Twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars means a lot to them. Am I right? It means a lot to them because their margins are just that close. But again, this is the regulatory environment in which we live in. In case of a broker convention, would you consider being our candidate for president? think it'll get to that you know today's primary day Wisconsin Maryland DC uh, and, and so we'll see what happens you know I think that a decision be, will be made and understand something in 2008 Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were dueling it out all the way late to June so don't allow people to create a panic and paranoia out there I mean this is this is what happens now I would prefer these guys stop the circular firing squad there's no doubt about that but I think that uh, everything will be okay by the time we get to Tampa and August. Uh, and along that same line a little bit, if enough write-in ballots were cast for you in uh, District 22, would you be allowed to serve 22 and 18? <laughs> <laughs> Only if they double the allowance for the staff so I can cover both uh, congressional districts. Look, you know, no matter what, I will, I will be a voice for you. And, you know, I showed you all previously. I mean, let me see if I got it. Look at that number, it keeps going up. Doesn't it? This is a voter, this is a voter card. 
vote card. This is what you put down into the slot to the machine. You vote yes, no. I don't vote present. Okay. <laughs> but every time you cast a vote, it does it does not affect the people in the congressional district for which you're the direct representative. It affects people all across the United States of America. So I may not be a direct representative of CD22. I will still be an indirect representative. I will still be a voice for you. And uh, we will always do the right thing for you. You never have to worry about that. Tim O'Neill asks that uh, states we're, we're activating missile defense because of North Korea. What secret deal are you aware of, or can you share, that Mr. Obama is promising Mr. Uh, Putin, Putin, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, of Russia. Hey, look, if it's secret, I couldn't tell you, because if I told you, then I'd have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I, I do not know what the little whisper thing was about flexibility. Uh, we need to be concerned about that, because if you're the President of the United States, you're Commander in Chief, you're charged with protecting the American people. And I don't know what kind of deals they're talking about. You know, there's a lot of talk about a certain leak of information about Israeli uh, bases being established in Azerbaijan, you know, this, that just came out. You know, those are the type of things we don't need happening in the United States of America. We need to stand by our allies, strongest ally we have in the Middle East, without a doubt, is Israel. Israel's in a tough situation. To the north, they got Lebanon with Hezbollah running the show up there, 50 to 50,000. You know, rockets and missiles. Every single city in Israel can be struck from southern Lebanon. In Gaza Strip, you got Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Al Quds, Al Aqsa, Maris Brigade. Every day, pretty much so, they're catching rockets and mortars coming out of there. Now we found out that the Muslim Brotherhood is going to put up a candidate for president, something they said they weren't going to do. And a year ago, when we asked Hosea Mubarak to step down, now we have Egypt that is controlled. Pretty much so, 78, almost 80 percent, they're calling by radical Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood. A couple of weeks ago, they rattled their sabers. They said, if you don't give us our 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars of foreign aid, we're going to launch against Israel. And without the approval of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Relations, the State Department and the Obama Administration wrote a check for 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars to Egypt. Those 19 hostages that they had over in Egypt, they got released. Pat yourself on the back. Because the American people wrote a check for $5 million to the Muslim Brotherhood and those radical Islamists for those 19 individuals to be released. And that's not how you secure the future of the United States of America, by whispering with President Medvedev and writing checks to radical Islamic groups. Those of you that knew me when I retired down here in 2004, you knew that my hair was not this gray. Or even two years ago, it wasn't this gray. That's what keeps me awake at night. Remember, your choice, your future, your decision. A uh, little note of interest there. You, through you, and uh, in Washington, we got a chance to meet the Israeli ambassador. And we learned that products uh, that part of the defense system, Iron Dome, which is being used to protect Israel, is manufactured in Pompano Beach. Uh, what are you going to be doing this year to coordinate efforts to reduce, reduce the budget by one trillion and work with Senate to rebuild Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security system after the health care laws overturned? I think we kind of talked about this. Yeah, well, we're going to, you know, come up with a plan in case the Supreme Court makes that decision. Now, of course, remember, if it passes in the House, it has to go to the Senate. We wish we had some people in the Senate who would work on us with just a simple thing to create a budget. So we will come up with a plan. We will get it over there to the Senate. It's the same as, you know, 27 pieces of legislation about job creation, about energy <coughs> policy creation, sitting on the desk of Harry Reid. 27. Luckily, if there were 30, they have passed three of them. This jobs uh, piece of the legislation the president will be signing sometime later this week. But we're doing the job that you sent us up there to do. I would like to get that number turned around. But I gotta have someone on the other side that is willing to admit it's a problem. 
Now someone on the other side that says we're going to add 11 trillion more dollars to that number. What do you think about, uh, think of uh, Sharif J. Lepron? It's an investigation of the Obama birth certificate fraud. Um, Stop. Nothing? Stop. Stop. Okay. okay. It's got to be about policy, folks. Don't, don't, don't get distracted. Go, don't, don't go down the rabbit hole. And the next thing you know, you lose focus on what's really important. Okay? That's what's really important. I'm going to tell you very simple. I really don't care about where he was born. I care about where he's taking my country. Yes. That's the most important thing. And that was the question, the next question I had, which is where do you think the country will be if Obama is reelected? Where are we headed? We just showed you. You know, what does flexibility mean? Ten trillion more in debt. Four more years of trillion dollar plus deficits. Gasoline prices that Secretary Chu once said that you know he wouldn't care if it was you know European style prices. So what? Five, six, seven dollars in order to force the American people to accept a green agenda. That's what you're going to get. Choice is yours. As Plato said, those who refuse to participate in politics shall be governed by their inferiors. You know, the facts, look, the facts are before you. And that doesn't lie. The choice is will the American people stop worrying about the cult of personality and really be serious about the legacy that we're going to leave for our children and grandchildren? That's a choice. And look, you know, I'm the number one target for the Democrat Party. Okay? Fifteen months in political office. Never been in politics before. I've never been a mayor, never been a commissioner, never been state house, state senate. Why would this simple guy from the inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, just a humble old soldier, all of a sudden draw the ire of an entire party. Because I show you that. And I'm going to continue to show you that. I'm going to continue to talk about the truth. And I'm going to continue to be your voice. And I'm not going to lay down and let people steamroll me. Because some of us who took an oath to serve this country, it means a lot to us. It's not a game. It's not a joke. It's personal. You want four more years of this? Remember that first slide we showed those 10 economic points and asked, are you better off? That was the simple question that Ronald Reagan asked. And every one of you need to ask yourself that. And you need to talk to your friends and ask them that question. And you need to look at your children and grandchildren and say, are they going to be better off? That's all you got to do. Republicans in charge of the House. Why doesn't the membership uh, and the bring to the floor and leadership? But uh, Mr. Moody, you know, what do you want them to bring to the floor? Be verified. Be verified. Let me tell you about illegal immigration. Nobody wants to touch it right now. I'll be very honest. I know that uh, they're looking at reworking the Dream Act over in the Senate side of the House. Let's see what it comes out to be. But let's be very honest. There are certain people who want to see a dependent voting electorate block that they can trust. And there are certain people who want cheap labor. Somewhere we've got to find out what's the pragmatic solution for this to ensure the safety and security and the sovereignty of the United States of America. So sometime later on this uh, year, I'll be giving a floor speech about illegal immigration. We'll let you know. It'll be on C-SPAN. With our uh, ever-growing Brazilian population, how are we progressing with, and our, we're getting so many visitors from Brazil as well, and we're getting so many requests. How is it going with uh, opening up the gates and letting the people come in? I understand there's issues with uh, them getting the proper documentation to come and visit. 
Well, that's one of the things I think we need to do is to look at our visa programs. We've got to improve those visa programs so that people on the other side, they can get the right type of visas to come here. But when the visa runs out, you got to go. This is a bottom line. That's respecting our laws. So I think that we have to, once again, enforce those laws. But we have to look at our system that, you know, we need to make sure that we have the right type of people and, uh, and enough workers on the other side that can allow people that want to come here for the right purposes. But those that are here for the wrong purposes, they can't be here. I mean, you know, right now I think there's a problem with the, uh, the ICE. They're looking for a new place for a detention facility here so that all the folks that they're gathering up, they can hold them before they you know, are able to send them back. And I know that uh, they were looking at putting it out at Southwest Ranch, and Southwest Ranch decided that they didn't want to have it there. So we have to really sit down with the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security and make sure that we're streamlining this process and make sure that we're working with the State Department so that we can look at who are the right type of people that want to come here, be a part of the American dream, invest, help us to grow our economy, and maybe they want to work toward becoming an American citizen. They have to come through the front door, not the back door. Uh, what do you do with the citizen's insurance? I mean, that's more of a state issue. And, you I, know, with respect and regard to the 10th Amendment, I don't think you guys want me jumping in here talking about that. But understand, <laughs> this is a violation of the free market. I mean, when you have a government-backed program, which is what citizen's insurance is, and it is forced competition out. So what was supposed to have been the insurance of you know last resort is now the insurance of first resort and they kind of have a little bit of a mini monopoly. So, you know, the free market works. It is when government gets involved and starts to pick the winners and losers in the free market, when government believes that they can take it from capitalism to crony capitalism, when government believes that they're the new venture capitalists, that's where we have problems. And you see that playing out right down here in the state. I have two more questions. Um, and I, I think Mr. McWalter wants to make sure I'll ask them all, so. Are you going to hire Keith Oberman to work on your campaign? <laughs> I mean, why not? I mean, I, you know, I'm sure, you know, Keith and I can get together and find some common ground, other than the fact that he, you know, I don't know, I'm the worst person in the world. But uh, look, I would love to sit down with anyone and just talk about the facts. You know, God bless liberal progressives. But the one question I have to ask them, show me where in the entire world what you believe in has ever been successful in the conversation. And uh, Stanley Turan wants me to make sure that we tell you we need jobs now, no foreign oil, fuel, and how about a four-day work week until the economy improves? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can do the Tabitha from Bewitched and go to a four-day work week. Uh, but then once again, guess what? That's a decision that a business owner should make. Now be careful, you know, what, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said, um, a government big enough to give you everything that you want is also big enough to take it away. So be careful about asking the government to come in and do so many things and make it a four-day work week. Because then what? I mean, can I then come back and make it a seven-day work week? Be careful about that. Don't go down the path of being a bureaucratic nanny state. Understand the left and right limits of a constitutional republic. Go back. This is the other little homework thing. Read the entire Declaration of Independence. Not just the first paragraph, but the entire Declaration of Independence. And then go back and read some of the Federalist Papers. And then read the United States Constitution. Because the American people need to understand the inextricable tie and relationship between what Jefferson listed were the grievances against an overreaching, intrusive, invasive government under King George III. And then understand from Jefferson identifying that and talking about how we declare independence, then you read how Madison and Hamilton 
talked about how we created a government structure that respected the sovereignty of the individual, that understood its mandates, its roles, and its responsibilities based upon the grievances that they had been subjected to. And when you understand that continuum of our foundational documents, then you understand the greatness of America. That's your homework. So God bless you all. Thank you for coming out.